do something I haven't done for a long time, a horror themed countdown. Seriously, my most recent one before this year was back in 2016. That's probably why I went with the super Halloween theme this year with the witches bosses and disturbing songs. Well, now that it's Halloween proper, let's finish strong with disturbing levels in games. Let's get the big one out of the way first. No horror games. That would defeat the whole point of the list. Also, what we're looking for is how disturbing the level is compared to the rest of the game. If the rest of the game is fun and cheery, and this one level is sh your pants scary and disturbing, then you tend to rank higher. All right, with that out of the way, let's finish October off with top 10 disturbing levels in non-horror games. Yoshi games, despite being pretty friendly and cutesy, are not above surprising you with some of its darker stuff. Yoshi's story with World 2, Topsy Turvy with Spirit of Fright, and our number 10, be Afraid of the Dark from Crafted World. This level got a lot of attention when the game came out, and it's not hard to see why. On top of being a dim, strangely quiet level, you're first greeted with an info box telling you, if he sees you, run away. And by he, they mean a rollerblading killer clown with an axe. Huh, guess someone found Adam McIntyre's puppet stash. <laughs> These things move crazy fast and can ambush you into corners and from within them if you're not careful. Given how dark most of the level is, you definitely can't panic too much if you don't want to be sent down to your cleaving death. And as a frosting atop the cake, they're invincible. So, uh, forget about taking them down. With these vicious damage dealers on hand, the scariness of this level is certainly more than visual. However, it is a bit of a one-trick pony. Once you figured out how the clowns work, they could hardly do much to surprise you in the long term. Plus, this game came out in the... Late 2010s. By that point, we've already been spoiled by scary elements and seemingly friendly games. Heck, it's been parodied to hell and back at this point. Still, at least kids nowadays who do grow up playing this game will get to share our experiences in unconditional horrors. After all, nothing screams nostalgia as much as literally screaming at a video game. Boy, am I glad I can talk about good Metroid stuff again. I wonder if Adam came here knowing that. Hey, if you had to talk about Other M as many times as I had, you'd do the same. But let's forget about that game for now and focus on one that really matters, Fusion. When you look at it, the Metroid franchise is already a soft horror as it were. Our lone bounty hunter scouring abandoned spacecrafts and hunting alien monsters. To fit right in with the Alien franchise, Samus Aran vs Xenomorph, who would win? Let us know in the comments. Getting back on track though, there's one particular part of Fusion that really hits the horror movie vibe the reactor core. This section of the game starts with a rather vague message from the computer telling you to return to your ship for important information. You get on the elevator and... Oh boy, that's a tone setter. You have to navigate around and figure out what's causing it, so you head over to the generator room to see what's up. The minute you enter, you already notice the vegetation growing out of every surface and how it's all mostly in the dark, occasionally only illuminated by an ominous red glow. Not only that, but areas you were able to go to before are now cut off, meaning there's no turning back until you've brought power back to the core and cleaned house. And that also means no save points. You think all that, plus a swarm of key hunters to deal with, is terrifying enough, right? Especially since there's no power for the save points, right? I'm getting goose pimples. Oh yeah, that's down here too. You end up literally dropping in on it and it's prepared to go on the attack. Unfortunately, at this point in the game, you still don't have anything that can kill it and you can only freeze it temporarily. Your only strategy? Run, book it, get thee behind me, evil Samuelacra! Thankfully, once you reach a safe hiding place, all you have to do is wait for it to leave the room and you're safe from the creepy look like for now. With all this eerie imagery, the claustrophobic feeling of having no way out and being chased by your doppelganger, it really feels like a level straight out of a horror film. Admittedly, I've seen this kind of scenario done a skosh better and, well, Metroid is kind of soft horror, but the tension and spookiness are still very much there. You know, I feel kind of bad that usually when I talk about Halo, it's only to talk about this section of the game. Hmm. It wasn't that long ago that I did a collab with No Not Ones and talked about Halo in fun yet depressing games. 
You know, how you go from a fun romp and killing aliens on a giant ring to running for your life from parasites whose only goal is to kill you and use your dying husk to procreate. Guess which one was the depressing part? Well, while I mentioned the part where the flood comes in and ruins your Sunday, I want to give a bit more context to the level it happens in. 343 Guilty Spark. You start the level by responding to a transmission from your fellow marines that Captain Keys has been taken by some unknown assailant. So, Master Chief, being the master and the chief he is, goes into the dark swamp where the transmission is coming from. He eventually finds a ship that's broadcasting the transmission and finds no signs of life. He keeps going, gunning down the Covenant in his way, but for some reason, they're terrified too. Chief heads into the nearby structure and descends deeper into it. On the way, he finds corpses of Marines and Covenant. Even deeper, he finds a paranoid Marine who keeps telling him to stay away, yelling about those things and how he doesn't want to die. Getting close gets you shot, so you need to go deeper to find your answers. Eventually, he finds a helmet on the floor that still has its recorder intact. And he watches. There! Mira! <laughs> hold still! Hold still! Let him have it! Just then, floods start appearing out of nowhere. Killing them is easy, but they're so numerous that they can overtake you if you aren't careful. You find an elevator, but it takes you even deeper into the facility. You fight your way up, running into other Marines on the way. Your radio tells you to find a nearby tower where you can be evac'd. As you do, the flood gets even more aggressive and violent. They killed your allies and turned their bodies against you. Finally, you and the survivors reach the tower in question, and when the flood are about to surround you, you're saved by several robots shooting beams at them. It's here that you come face to face with the most terrifying and disturbing entity in Halo. A being so vile and evil that it makes the flood human in comparison. Greetings, I am the monitor of Installation 04. I am 343 Guilty Spark. Oh, you have a lot of nerve being alive. I mentioned this before, but from this point on, Halo becomes more horror than space shooter. Not as bad as Dead Space, but the Flood are absolutely terrifying. The atmosphere and mood in this level is incredible with the slow build-up to the reveal of one of gaming's most terrifying races. The rest of the game has several levels with the Flood, so I can't put it any higher due to other levels having similar tones to this, but this one still has all of them beat. I still have nightmares. For the most part, World of Goo is a unique and happy puzzle game. Drag the balls of goo around and build structures leading towards the pipes to collect the goo. The game is divided into four chapters, and at first, everything seemed simple, bizarre, and quirky. But then, once we reach the third chapter, things take an eerie, industrial turn. I got it, Pittsburgh! The ambiance becomes a lot darker, with a heavier emphasis on industrialist imagery. Fire, smokestacks, smog, oil spills, and barely an ounce of nature to be found. Or at least, barely an ounce that hasn't been dug up or contaminated. On some levels, the music takes on a creepy, ominous tone, and even the map is cold and lifeless, completely devoid of color. One level in particular, Misty's Long Bony Road, is nothing but a barren wasteland full of dead animal bones and skeletons. And on one level, there's a sign that pretty much says it all. You can't stop progress. In case it wasn't obvious, this chapter is a walking, talking spoof of the industrial movement and big businesses. Yeah, nearly every piece of media in existence has gone over this ongoing issue at least once, and it might seem a little preachy. But to me, there's a right and wrong way to spread a message. And this was definitely the creative way, showing us the follies of unrestrained big business through chilling ambiance and imagery filling us with a sense of dread. It's especially disturbing compared to the previous calmer and greener chapters. In a way, the industrial theme was actually built as far back as the first chapter and it all culminated in this horrific section. Great, now I can't look at Goo without thinking of Hexus from Ferngully. If they start singing like Tim Curry and calling a lawyer, All right, it's Zelda time. So I think you guys are expecting Majora to appear here. Well, while it isn't a horror game, it is one of the most depressing games in the Zelda catalog. So of course it should appear here, right? Well, nope, not this time. I'm subverting the trope as they say, and I will never say that again. 
So let's talk about Ocarina. Much more light-hearted than Majora, but even the brightest light can cast the darkest shadow. So once you're in the adult arc, you need to get the Lens of Truth from Kakariko Village. To be fair, you don't technically need it to complete the game, but let's be honest, it's painful without it. So to get it, you need to enter the most dangerous place imaginable, the Village Well. Yeah, we're not talking about the Shadow Temple, we're not talking about Akana Valley from Majora or the bottom of the Ancient Cistern from Skyward Sword. We're talking about the fucking bottom of the well from Ocarina and I am owning this. So why the bottom of the well? Because it has no reason to be as creepy as it is. For some reason, they decided to take every creepy enemy in the game and throw it in here. Redeads, Gibdos, Like Like, Skulltulas, Wallmasters, and Floormasters and of course, the creepiest mid-boss in Zelda history, Dead Hand. A boss that has his hands grab you and hold you until the main body shimmies over to bite you. The first floor of the well isn't even that creepy, but of course, the deeper you go, the worse it gets. Especially with the bottom floor being just pools of poison surrounded by a battalion of re-deads. You ever want to be dropped into an army of re-deads? Really? You don't? And now you're unsubscribing because I put the thought into your head? I resent you, but I don't blame you. The good thing is, in the original Ocarina, you only need to traverse through the first floor, but you still need to deal with Dead Hand. In Master Quest, you need to traverse the full dungeon, which includes everything I said above, but the bottom level now includes boulders and a wall master. Yay! The reason the well is here over the Shadow Temple is that what comes in the Shadow Temple is more... expected. You see Shadow Temple in the name and realize, oh yeah, it might be creepy. The well just comes out of freaking nowhere with what it puts you through and makes you want to dive into a well yourself just to get away from it. Okay, so I might need therapy. The Pokemon world really is a fascinating place to live. An entire planet full of wondrous creatures of all shapes and sizes, and each one with an interesting story to tell. Like how Parasect is a zombie to a parasitic mushroom, or how Yamas carries the face of its former human life, or Cubone wearing the skull of its dead mother. Okay, who writes this? When Pokemon gets creepy, it gets deliciously creepy, along with some really creative Pokedex entries, the franchise never shied away from the supernatural. Lavender Town, The Old Chateau, or my personal pick for this list, The Strange House from Black 2 and White 2. A desolate house in the Unova region that's legitimately haunted. The furniture shivers and shakes and even moves on its own blocking certain entrances. I don't know whether to be frustrated because I wanted to go into that room or to shout, Honey, get the cross! Obviously, there's a lot of ghost Pokemon littered throughout the house, but there's also an actual ghost roaming around. A very familiar little girl. Remember in the original Black and White, that ghostly girl you encounter at the Marvelous Bridge who vanishes the moment you approach her? This is her place of residence. And every encounter gives us a cryptic hint about what actually happened to her. Whatever it was involved Cresselia, the Lunar Wing, and horrific nightmares, most likely from Darkrai. I read a few theories, and this one seems the most likely one. A little girl was plagued with endless nightmares by Darkrai, and needed a Cresselia's Lunar Wing to repel the nightmares away. But by the time the wing was brought to her, it was already too late. She couldn't escape the nightmares and passed away in her sleep, never getting a chance to see the legendary Lunar Pokémon. Instead, she haunted the old house, waiting for someone to find the wing and bring it back to its rightful owner. Oh man, this is totally horror movie style right here. I gotta tip my hat to Game Freak for this. It takes a talented storyteller to be able to write such a tragic backstory for a haunted house in a subtle way and still be appropriate to the target demographic. Bear in mind, this is just one of the many theories behind the legend, but one thing's for certain. No one enters the dream house without getting the heebie-jeebies. Super Paper Mario is easily one of the darkest games in the series. Rather than trying to save someone, your goal is to prevent the destruction of all worlds. At one point, you die and have to crawl your way out of hell. That this was Mario, not God of War. Throughout the story, you have the void looming in the distance as a constant reminder of what could happen. And as you obtain the pure hearts, it grows bigger and bigger. This all comes to a head in chapter six. 
in Samr's kingdom, you must complete the duel of 100 to get the next pure heart. It's not easy to focus on given that the void is about to destroy the whole place. Of course, you can rest easy knowing that you'll stop it just in time. Now, instead this happens. And when you return to the Samr's kingdom, it's been reduced to this. It's all gone. Everything. Gone deadly on. This is the horrific reality of what will happen if you fail. All those other places you explored could end up like this if you don't succeed. There are no regular enemies to fight here. Just a long stretch of blank space and ruins. There's nothing to do other than let the gravity of the situation come sink in. Unfortunately, I can't rank World of Nothing any higher because it admittedly drags. Yeah, I guess that's kind of the point, but it eventually becomes less what the hell everything's gone to. So am I going to fight something now or what? I'm getting kind of bored. Still though, top marks for use of minimalism in horror and proof that sometimes less really is more. Compared to other Pikmin games, Pikmin 2 is probably the one that puts you the least on edge. This is because one of its key features, the dungeons, are sub-levels with no time limit. It may have its fair share of surprise hazards, but for most of the time, you can traverse through those at your leisure and take your time to plan your every move. And then there's the submerged castle, which does mostly none of that. To kick things off, the entrance to this dungeon is covered in water, so you can only bring blue Pikmin here. Exploits don't work. Of course, that doesn't help when it's clearly shown that there are hazards of all kinds to be found here. Flames, electric, poison, you name it. The dungeon pretty much leaves you isolated, with your only chance to pass these hazards being the stray bulb men you have to collect on each floor. Since the bulb men are not expendable, you have to stay on your toes and really keep your squad safe as they carry the treasures through the various hazards and enemies. Now I know what you're thinking, there's no time limit, is there? So what's the rush? Well, have you noticed how unsettling the music is? These eerie whistles are like an indicator that you're being watched and something's about to go horribly wrong as you walk down this watery grave. And sure enough, if you take your sweet time through each floor, this happens. Ah, get off my lawn! This is the Water Wraith an entity who chases you around the dungeon with a steamroller. Any Pikmin caught by it dies instantly, and the only way you can evade it is by moving out of the floor it's prowling. You can't kill it, so spend too much time on the floor and you're done for. The dark and tight corridors of the dungeon means you don't have much breathing room to squeeze yourself out of the Wraith's track either. Combine the limited resources available to you alongside a looming threat waiting to strike you down, this whole setup really is reminiscent of survival horror. And given how intense the core gameplay of Pikmin can already be, this nightmare of a dungeon absolutely epitomizes its most fearsome aspects. Thankfully, making it to the end of the dungeon is absolutely rewarding. You get to produce some purple Pikmin of your own as a catharsis against everything the Water Wraith stands for. Popping Bubble Buddy has never been so satisfying. Admittedly, from a certain point of view, the world of Undertale could already be considered scary, what with all the monsters running around and this little monstrosity. But as you journey through it, depending on what route you take, you realize it's full of some of the nicest creatures you'll ever see. From loving mother figures, to socially awkward tsundere's, to beautiful sunshine babies of pure joy and happiness. However, there are at least two moments that are genuinely creepy. One is the trippy boss fight with Photoshop Flowey, and the other is arguably the darkest secret in the whole game. So just to set the scene, it's the pacifist route, and you just gave Alphys the letter from Undyne. And now you're off to meet Alphys in her lab. Suddenly, you find a note outside the bathroom with a cryptic message from Alphys saying she needs to fix her own mistake and tells us to step into the bathroom. And oh, okay, it's an elevator? That's weird. I wonder where it goes. Like, ah! Okay, that's a cheap jump scare. Where the heck are we going? Oh, hi there, spooky laboratory. Uh, what horrors will you bring to the dinner table today? Oh, I can't wait to see what kinds of friends I'll make down here and. Holy crap, and a peanut! 
So, yeah, welcome to the true lab. Already, you're probably getting the creeps with the shadowy ambiance and eerie music, but things only get scarier when you meet the locals. The Amalgamates. Freaky, twisted fusions of fallen monsters. They're gruesome, they're terrifying, they're... Okay, that one's actually kind of sweet if you overlook the spooky ghost-like monster looking over you while you sleep. But where did these science disasters come from? That's where the real horror comes in. Years ago, this was just a normal lab where Alphys experimented with fallen monsters, trying to bring them back to life with human determination. Unfortunately, yeah, that didn't work out. The monsters weren't compatible with determination, and they ended up melting and turning into these fusion monstrosities. Worst of all, we'd later find out that one of the experiments involved a golden flower. This is where Flowey came from. Every terrible, weird, disturbing, and crazy thing that happens in Undertale originates in this area, and it was all because of Alphys. I didn't mean to. Honestly, I feel bad for Alphys. She was only trying to help and was racked with guilt over what happened. Unfortunately, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and it all starts in a creepy, gloomy laboratory. Can we go back to tutorials for butterscotch pie now? I really need to pick me up. Creepy Castle, Donkey Kong 64. It definitely lives up to its name with the foreboding music, spooky ambience, and ghoulish monsters around every corner. Ripple Star, Kirby 64. The disturbing factor really picks up around stage two with the haunting music and more shadowy imagery. Well, it gets creepier in the boss fight. The Sewers from Arkham Asylum. This is arguably scarier than Scarecrow's Nightmare World because of how claustrophobic and real the whole experience is. The Manor, A Hat in Time. <laughs> Back in the day, the point-and-click adventure game was the genre that many of us started with. Due to their simple gameplay and objectives, they were a great way to introduce games to a complete newcomer. As such, there are no shortage of edutainment games to be found in this style. Among the hundreds out there is Forestia. Haven't heard of it? Well, don't feel bad. It's incredibly obscure and hasn't seen any kind of re-release. Not that it's even that remarkable. To begin with, 90% of it is your typical late 90s edutainment game. Not bad, it's just not exceptional. The remaining 10% though, is a very different story. At one point, you're told that your friend Max has found a constellation of a dragon. The two of you then fall asleep and you wake up to... Just watch. Educational? The whole forest is covered in a blood red tint and the nature sounds are replaced with a droning ambience. Two characters you meet include a realistic skeleton and a dragon that gives you an ominous message. Don't you know the last hour has come? Only you can still undo the terrible spell. But after all of this, the game just casually laughs the whole thing off as a dream. Now on its own, The Nightmare Secrets admittedly doesn't go as far as other entries on this list. Honestly, I've already mentioned stuff that's way more graphic. However, relativity is a big factor here. So for that, Prestia easily earns number one. The sheer contrast between The Nightmare Secrets and the rest of the game is staggering to say the least. Keep in mind, this was an edutainment game targeted towards little kids. It's pretty much a real life creepypasta without jarring the turn is. It's like if you were watching Barney and he decided to sacrifice the kids to an eldritch abomination. Kaboom! Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragonfighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.